Okay, we'll get started. So today the topic for discussion is uh, feedback control systems. Uh, and this is basically a crash course in EC3551 or 5551. So in the next couple of days, we'll try and understand what a control system means, what's a feedback control system, and, and uh, what are the different ways by which controllers are designed in feedback control system. How many of you have taken a course in feedback controls in the past? Oh, everyone, okay. <laughs> I guess I should still cover it. Uh, Okay, so, so you all seem to, have, seem to be aware of uh, feedback control systems. Uh, most of the systems nowadays are feedback control systems. Our air conditioning system in this room is a feedback control system. And there are two essential elements of a feedback control system. So one is the state. And the second one is the action or the control. <clears throat> Two elements of feedback control system. Let me give you some example, and then we will try and formalize what the concept of state in a feedback control system is. So if you look at this room, and suppose we want to maintain the temperature of this room at 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh. Okay, uh, we want to maintain the temperature of this room at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's what this thermostat is telling us. Okay, so the first important thing we need to define is what's the state for this particular system. So the system is uh, the thermal conditions of this room. That's the system. And we want to keep the thermal conditions in a way that's comfortable to us because we are staying in this room. And given that this system is given to us, we have to determine what the state is. And so the state is supposed to be encompassing all the information that is needed for making the decision or taking an action or controlling the thermal system inside the room. So what do you think is the state for this air conditioning system? Temperature. temperature, okay? So, so the state, intuitively, it seems that the temperature of the room is the state of the system. It's, the, it's, it's, it's a parameter, it's a variable whose information is needed for us to figuring out whether to push cold air into the room or push hot air into the room or not, okay? So this is the information that we need to make that decision. And what is the action here for the air conditioning system? The action would be for how long and how much amount of cold air and hot air we need to, uh, we need to, uh, uh, release in this particular room. So amount of cold slash hot air to be, um, I don't know what the verb should be, amount of cold slash hot air to be in, inserted, no, not inserted. Uh, what should I say? To be released, okay. Okay, so this thermostat here is actually a controller. What it does is it looks at the state and depending upon some rules that are embedded within the microcontroller in that thermostat, it looks at the state and it takes an appropriate action for that particular state. 
And it does that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days in a year. Okay, does that all the time. That's the sole purpose of that particular thermostat is. Now let's look at a, a, a vehicle that's traveling on a road. So this is a road. Here is a vehicle and it's moving in this direction. What do you think is the state for this vehicle? Let's, let's do the obvious. What is the action? What are the actions available to us in the vehicle? What can we do in the vehicle? Steering. Steering. And what else? Braking. Braking. And what else? Acceleration, right? Steering, braking, acceleration. Three actions that are available to us when we are driving a car. Now let's come to the state. What information is needed by a driver in order to drive the vehicle? Sorry? Velocity. OK, what else? Velocity of what? Okay, velocity of vehicle in front. I'm assuming you also mean velocity of our vehicle, the vehicle that you are controlling. What else? Position. Sorry? Position. Current, position. Current position. Current position. Okay, sure, why not? Position of vehicle. Well, position, yeah, position of vehicle of our vehicle. What else? What about position of vehicle in front? I guess we could replace that with the distance to the vehicle in front. So instead of talking about position, let's just say distance to the vehicle in front. OK. I have four states now. What else? Yeah. So the the shape of the road. Typically, the way to detect the shape of the road is to look at the lane markings. Okay, that's what you do. Uh, but of course, if the lane markings are not there, then it's a big mess. Then, then you have to somehow figure out how you want to steer the vehicle. What else? How about the heading angle? The heading angle of the vehicle. When you are doing lane change and stuff, lane change maneuver, you have to steer the vehicle in certain specific fashion, so the heading angle would change for the vehicle. So the heading angle is also an important state of the vehicle. And if you do not include it at par as part of the state of the vehicle, you won't be able to control the vehicle in an appropriate fashion. Okay? A lot of this is, I mean, so what we are trying to do here is we are, there is an action, there, there, is, there is a feedback control activity that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And what I'm trying to do here is to specify what all information goes into making the decision about how to drive the vehicle, okay? And we need to specify all this information because it's useful for the system modeling. Okay, so we have about one, two, three, six states. Anything else? The internal characteristics of the car, temperature of the engine, uh, fuel, but I don't think that's the problem for the, for the driver in the vehicle. Do you as driver figure, I mean, does your decision making capability changes with what the engine is doing? Accelerating is consuming fuel, I have to, I don't know, but there is a system keeping track of how much fuel is there. It depends on how long I should drive, right? Right, okay. Uh, yeah, then you are adding a lot more states. Let's, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so his point is that you need to know how much fuel is there in the, in the vehicle before you figure out how long you can drive. Uh, but those are very high level 
decision making that needs to be done. Let's just focus on a vehicle that's going on a road and there is enough fuel in the vehicle. But, but that, is, that is indeed correct. A higher level decision maker needs to figure out how much fuel is in the vehicle. And if there isn't enough fuel, then you need to figure out where to get gas or where to charge the vehicle. So in fact, if you buy a Tesla, the Tesla does that calculation every time you start the vehicle and enter where you want to go. So it will tell you whether you can reach the destination or not. And if you cannot reach the destination, what's the charger that you can go to in order to refuel your car and be on the destination? OK, so for that particular problem, uh, knowing how much fuel is in the vehicle is an important state. But, but for this purpose, we are not necessarily considering that. Let me put a stop sign. No, this is not a stop sign. This is a stop sign. So I put a stop sign on the road, and there could be traffic lights on the road. Does that change the states that you need to take care of in making your decision? What else? What changes? Sorry? Camera. Right, so the velocity is already uh, part of your state. So, so, so yeah, that's still part of the state, but something changes, something. Based on the traffic signal, the driver has to braking. Right, okay. So based on the traffic signal, uh, let's consider the stop sign and we'll get to traffic signal in a bit. What information is needed for you to, let's, let's change the problem. So once you have a stop sign, you need some information in order to figure out where to stop the vehicle. What information is that? GPS. Sorry? The distance where you should stop. Right, so distance to the stop sign. So if you're far away from the stop sign, you don't care. But as you get closer and closer, you have to figure out, take into account the distance and come up with appropriate braking action to stop before the stop sign. OK. Uh, so you have, went, you have gone past the stop sign. Now there is a traffic light. And as she suggested, you need to know whether the traffic light is red, green, or blue, not blue, yellow. And uh, based on that information and the distance to the traffic sign, the tra traffic light, you need to figure out whether you want to accelerate, decelerate, brake, you know, uh, steer, all that stuff needs to be decided. So as you can see, depending on the problem, this is a simple problem. This is a more complicated problem. And the dimension of the state space changes quite significantly as you go from simple problems to more complicated problems. Okay, so that's something we need to keep in mind. That when you come up with a feedback control system, you need to define what the state of the system is. You need to define what the action available to the decision maker is. And depending on the system, you could really have a very large number of states. And in the autonomous driving situation, you probably are looking at the state space of about 15 or 20 dimensions. Okay, because there are too many things that are going on when you are driving the vehicle autonomously. You have vehicles on this side of the road, you have vehicles on that side of the road, you may have lane markings. You may want to be on the center of the lane. So you need to figure out what's the distance of your vehicle with the center of the lane is in the, the lane in which you are going. And, uh, and you need to look at uh, maybe some other objects that are on the road. So for instance, in the case of Tesla, uh, one of the things it does it senses is if there is going to be an accident in front of the vehicle or not, okay? And based on that information, so what it does is it sends out the radar signal and it looks at the trajectory of all the vehicles that are in front of the car and then it does some extrapolation to figure out if two trajectories are going to collide or not. And if there is going to be a collision, it takes a preventive action, preventive braking action in the vehicle itself. Okay, and there are many such videos on YouTube that you can see where a Tesla driver is driving on the road and, and uh, the Tesla started beeping even before the accident happens 
and within a couple of seconds of beeping, the accident happens, but the Tesla is already on its way of, uh, to stop the vehicle before it hits the vehicles in front. So all of that is, is part of the state for Tesla's decision making about whether to do an emergency stopping or not. Okay. So, so what does a feedback control system look like? So we talked about state, we talked about action. One thing, one important thing to note is state must encompass all information needed to control. And this is an important point, okay? It must encompass all information needed to control, reliably, effectively, securely, all that stuff. And many a times, if you are trying to design a controller for a new system, let's say you have a battery pack in front of you, uh, you, you, you went to Ford or you went to GM, and you are given this job of uh, uh, coming up with control strategy for the battery pack, now you are in a, in a, in a, in a, in a problem because, because these battery packs are so, such a new technology that you don't quite know what all states the battery pack has. So, of course, over the last 15 or so years, people have done the research and have figured out, okay, these are the states that are important for a battery, uh, but, but still, that's an evolving field. So as time progresses, we may figure out more and more important states for the batteries, for making appropriate decisions about whether to use the battery for driving, whether to use fuel for driving, how should we charge the, vehicle, uh, charge the battery, how should we discharge the battery, and all that stuff. So, so when you're given a new system, it's a priori not clear what the state should be, as is the case for lithium ion batteries, and it takes quite a few years to figure out, okay, these are the states, here is how you estimate those states, here are the sensors for measuring those states, and, uh, and here is a way to map the state to action so that we are doing a reliable control. Okay, does that make sense? For traditional problems, like let's say you go to an oil and natural gas plant or you go to a chemical plant, that has been around for 50 years or so, it's quite likely that they have figured out what the states of the systems are and what the dynamics of the system looks like. And so when you go there to work, you will automatically be handed, these are the states, these are the actions, figure out what the best strategy is, best control strategy is. Okay. So, so that's the first part. The second part that I want to mention is that state at time t plus one must be a function of state at time t and action at time t. Okay, this is for deterministic system and I'm going to add another and disturbance at time t. So these are the two properties that the state must satisfy. And we talked about why the state must encompass all information needed to control and in some situations it may not be clear what the state of the system is. But the second one is equally important. Uh, so if you have a system where the history is important then all that history becomes part of the state, okay? Because then the state at time t plus one 
is a function of state at time t, which includes the history, an action at time t, and potentially disturbance at time t. We didn't really talk about disturbance, but, uh, but, but let's hold on to it for a bit. Of course, in the autonomous driving example, you kind of know that the traffic around you and the traffic light, those are all disturbance on the system. And they affect how the state changes over time. So let's, let's, not, let's not talk about disturbance for the moment. But let's try and understand what, that, what it means for state at time t plus 1 must be a function of state at time t and action at time t. Let's assume that there is no disturbance in the system. Now, um, let me give you an example. So consider a natural language processing system, okay, your email, for instance, uh, uh, if you're using Gmail or if you're using any other email service, it has to look at your email and figure out, is this a junk email or is this an authentic email, okay? Now, when it's going through your email, individual words could be, like, let's say you, you, were, you were asked to design a mapping that maps an email to a, uh, to a junk email versus not a junk email. So you can look at individual words and you can try to make a decision. And that creates a problem because usually these spammers are very intelligent. They will figure out what your uh, junk email algorithm is and they will try to avoid it. So nowadays, what they do is they look at the entire history, the entire sequence of words that are written in an email. Okay. And, and if you model it as a system that needs to be driven to a certain state, you have to keep track of all the history of words that have been used in the email in order to make a decision whether it's a spam email or not a spam email. So a lot of modern NLP systems, they contain the history of states. In this case, states would be the words, the words that are appearing in the email. And the time is the, the sequence of words. So at time t equals to 0 corresponds to the first word of the email, time t equals to 1 corresponds to the second word of the email, and so on. So the state at time t plus 1 must be a function of state at time t and action at time t. So in the case of emails, they, the state is the entire history which is the entire sentence that is written by the, by the spammer. Okay, so a lot of the newer uh, junk email systems are so good primarily because they don't look at words, they look at the entire sentences. And that's what I mean uh, in this particular case. Um, in the case of chemical plants and in the case of uh, thermal, uh, uh, thermal storage systems, the history is important, okay, the history. So, so for instance, for this particular room, here is a way to think about it. For this particular room, let's assume that we want to understand how the temperature of the room changes over time, right? Now, you know that this room has a lot of desks and chairs, and each of them is in thermal equilibrium with the outside, with the air of the room. But if the temperature is rising or it's going down, then that equilibrium gets disturbed. And so the, the how the temperature of the room evolves depends on what the temperature of the desk is, what the temperature of the chair is, what their thermal coefficients are, and so on. And in that case, the change in temperature is dependent on the history of temperature that the room has seen so far. And in that case, again, the history of state becomes important. And so, or history of temperature becomes important, and so your state would contain information about the history of temperature that you have seen so far. Okay, so it, this is again something you need to keep in mind uh, when you are looking at a system, whether the history of the quantities you think are important. Uh, so this is the state that you design. Now you have to think about Okay, is the history of this information important to us? Is the history of this, import, this information important to us? If not, you can skip that. You, you don't have to include it in the description of the state. But suddenly, you figure out that, okay, the history of this is actually important to us. Um, then you have to, again, put that as part of the state description. So just because 
So let's look at the distance to stop sign. So when the distance to stop sign is positive, it means that you are approaching a stop sign. But if it is negative, you are way past the stop sign. So in that case, you have to look at the entire history. You just can't make a decision based on the current state. And uh, if you are designing, so a lot of people in Center for Automotive Research at OSU, they design algorithms for navigating the stop sign. And they look at the entire history of trajectory, not just the instantaneous distance to the stop sign. And in those cases, knowing the history is important for making the decision about when to brake, where to brake, how to navigate the stop sign, because there is some history dependence in the state transition. So, and why is this important? Because when you go out in the field, and you are designing algorithms for feedback control systems, you will have to keep asking yourself this question, is the history important or not? If it is, include it in the state. If it is not important, you remove it from the state and you will still be doing fine. And the second thing is, uh, rather the first thing is that the state must encompass all the information needed to control. So with that, hopefully you understand now what the state and what the action of a feedback control system should be. Yes? Uh, is there an example where uh, the state of the previous, the current state of the system is not a function of previous state of the previous, I mean, previous value of the state? Do we have any example like that? Because uh, so not for a feedback control system, but in general, yes, there could be some states that you do not control. An example of that is weather. So what the outside temperature is affects the, so you can think of weather both as a disturbance or as a state dependent on how the weather influences your decision making. But the outdoor temperature, there is nothing you can do to control the outdoor temperature. It's controlled by the nature, right? So in that case, whatever action you pick, uh, you don't really influence that particular state, which is the outside temperature or the outside humidity or, or whatever, like air, wind, wind speed. All of that is controlled by nature. And the reason for that is nature is such a huge sink that whatever you do is such a small disturbance that it really doesn't matter. So okay. it's just uh, for a particular system, there, there might be a state where uh, it might be changed by other state rather than its own Correct. state. Correct. Correct. Your own action. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So ocean temperatures are also similar. Uh, they are influenced by nature, not by, you know, if you're riding a ship or something, you really don't change the temperature of the ocean. So those are such large sinks that heat sinks or whatever, uh, uh, they are systems that are controlled by such large entities that you don't really have influence on that. Uh, economy is another such example. Your action doesn't really affect the economy, right? So you just have to react to what the economy is doing. You can't really go back and influence the economy. Any other question? Yes? Was this case on the spam example that we gave? Yes. Uh, so the algorithm, does it try to approximate the function? Uh, Right, so in that case, it's a classification problem, so you are trying to approximate a function. That's right. Okay. But this, the description of the state there has changed over the last 15 or 20 years. Any other question? So in case of a larger action of the, the time t, if, uh, if that becomes a function of t plus 1 as in, will it, should we include that? System. Sorry, I didn't get your so question. There's a state, uh, say x y. There's huh. a state x y. Uh -huh. At t plus one, uh, with negligible action, it doesn't it doesn't make any huge difference. Uh -huh. At t plus one, if it if you make a significant amount of uh, change at time t, if it affects state at t plus one, should we include that? Oh, that's that's an excellent point. Will, so that what you're talking about, so his question is, uh, I have a state and I take an action, it really doesn't influence that state very much, 
Okay, so then is that part of the state description of the system? Uh, it turns out that it is. And we are going to talk about singular perturbation theory in maybe like a few classes later, maybe towards the end of next week. And in singular perturbation system, this is exactly the situation. And I'll give you a concrete example. If you look at the engine of your vehicle, it works every milliseconds, okay? Or maybe like 10 milliseconds. On the other hand, your decision making is happening at the scale of seconds. So whatever decision the engine makes doesn't really affect your state that much. You know, the states that you're seeing, which is distance to the stop sign, traffic light, and all that stuff. So the way to solve those problems is you split the system into a slow dynamic system and a high dynamics, like a fast dynamic system. And then you, um, that's called a singular perturbation theory. So it's a singularly perturbed system. And then you solve the, uh, you come up with a controller for the fast dynamics and you feed that into the controller for the slow dynamic system. No, you come up with a controller for the slow dynamic system and then you feed that into the controller for the fast dynamic system. And that's how you design the control strategy. So we'll talk about it in the next, next class. But that is indeed the case in many uh, large scale system where the planning has to happen at a slow dynamic state scale, but the execution has to happen at a very fast dynamic scale. And, uh, and those are called singularly perturbed systems. Any other question? And in that case, the state is, it is part of the state, but not, it's not part of the state for the slow, uh, for the fast dynamics. It's just part of the state for the slow dynamic system. But the slow and fast is relative. In the driving example, slow means uh, in the order of seconds and fast means of the order of milliseconds. Uh, but if you are, I don't know, if you're using rocket trajectory or something, then uh, fast would mean uh, of the order of seconds and slow would mean of the order of minutes. Okay, so it really depends on what kind of system you're looking at. Any other question? Okay. So typically, in, uh, so now we have studied a lot of qualitative aspects of feedback control system. Now let's get to the math aspect of it. So we use xt to denote the state. at time t, ut to denote the action at time t. And the state is updated according to xt plus one equals to ft xt ut or So now we have made things a bit more concrete and a bit more formal. So I have the state at time t, I have, the, I have taken an action ut at time t, and my state at time t plus one is some function ft of the current state and the current action that I've taken. Now in the case of disturbance where the outside weather influences something or people are coming in and out of the classroom so that's affecting the, the thermal characteristics of this building, so those are the cases when there is a disturbance on the system and uh, we need to figure out how to, like how does the state changes as a function of both the current state and current action and the disturbance that is applied to the system. Now, one of the things we'll talk about uh, later on is when the disturbance, so the disturbance could be of two types. Uh, it could be deterministic, it could be stochastic. Deterministic is like weather, you know, you kind of know the forecast, it's, things are not going to be very different than what the forecast says. So that's a deterministic disturbance. And then you could have stochastic disturbance where you don't quite know what's going to happen. 
So for instance, let's look at this particular room, right? So the class started at, uh, I don't know, 12.40 p.m. So the class started at 12.40 p.m. All of you were inside the class at 12.40 p.m. And from 12.40 p.m., nobody is going to come in, nobody is going to go out, the doors are all closed. Um, we are all in a same configuration inside this room. So over the next 55 minutes, the class ends at 1.35 p.m. So in that interval, there is no disturbance inside this room, okay? The room has no disturbance. Nobody is going in, nobody is going out. Everybody is sitting at the same location. So we are in this particular situation. But as soon as the class changes, some people will go out, some more people will come in. That's the disturbance, okay? And at this point of time, I don't quite know how many people are going to come in for the next class, right? So that's a stochastic disturbance. On the other hand, if I knew how many people are going to come, so for instance, there are 40 people registered in the next class, and so five people will go out and 30 people will come in, that becomes a deterministic disturbance. Okay, so the disturbance could be deterministic or stochastic. So we will talk about random variables and uh, statistics a little bit, uh, maybe like in the two, three weeks from now. And we'll talk about the subject of stochastic disturbance at that time. Okay, any questions so far? Okay. Yes, please. All we're talking about is, is uh, discrete time. That's right. We're talking about discrete time. Um, because this is a course on cybersecurity, I want to focus purely on discrete time because all systems are discrete in the eyes of the computer. <coughs> okay. Any other question? All right. So now let's talk about... So this is the control system part. Let's talk about feedback. Okay. So the idea in feedback control system is I want my ut to be some function gamma t of xt. And this is known as feedback control policy or feedback decision policy. So since many of you have taken feedback controls, can you tell me the first most important feedback? Like, let, leave aside the human interactions. Human interactions always involve feedback. But for an engineering system, what was among the first feedback control system? Anyone knows? Sorry? type of feedback is the most... Uh, Heat wall? No, no, I mean, your question is what type of feedback is, 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 is... No, not what type of feedback. What's the first feedback control system in the history of mankind? Thermostat? Sorry? Thermostat? Thermostat? No. Shower unity feedback? Maybe. What, what led to uh, industrial revolution? Railway, railway. Sorry? Railways. It's related to railways. It's related to combustion engine, but it's not combustion engine itself. Okay, so governors, which is used to uh, control, uh, auto I should say automatically control control the steam input.
into two steam engine. Who was the inventor for governor? James Watt. How do we measure electricity? In watts, right? So it's all connected. Okay, so prior to, I think, I think this was designed in 1750s. I, I may be a little bit wrong about the date, but somewhere around 1750s. So before 1750s, there was a actual person who would figure out how much coal to put um, in the furnace to run the steam engine. Okay, and there used to be a lot of accidents because people can miscalculate. So what uh, James Watt did was he came up with a way to measure the rotational speed of the engine and use that to figure out how much steam to let into the engine versus how much steam to let out of the engine. And that was known as governor. And uh, it used to automatically control the steam input to the steam engine. And it was one of the first feedback control systems. Uh, wildly successful, led to the uh, industrial revolution. I mean, not single-handedly, but it was like one of the major component of industrial revolution. Because then the steam engines became extremely safe because it was automatically controlling how much steam should go into the engine. So the engines became safe, so more people started using steam engines, so more growth happened, and so more ec economic growth happened, and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's how we had industrial revolution, and that's how we're, ha we're enjoying all this nice stuff around us. Okay. Now, the first person to analyze the mathematical properties of governor was James Clark Maxwell in 1857. So he wrote a paper on, with the title On Governors, which is the first paper on feedback control systems. And it's the same Maxwell who came up with Maxwell equations that you may have studied in electro, electromagnetics. No. Where, where do you study Maxwell equation? In physics. Some physics class, you might have studied Maxwell equation. So same guy. Everything is connected. How am I doing on time? Oh, I have a lot of time. Uh, OK. So the goal of a controls engineer is to identify this mapping that takes as input the state and outputs the action. OK? And this, this mapping is known as the feedback control policy. And it's feedback because the state is fed back into the action. So this is what a feedback control system typically looks like. This is the reference state. This is the actual state. This is the error. This is the action, ut. And uh, what else? Yeah, that's it. This is the controller, so gamma t. This is the actuator, which is attached to the plant, and that runs the plant. OK. And this is what the uh, schematic of a feedback control system, a typical feedback control system, looks like.
Okay, all of you have seen this in your 3551 type class. Um, so typically, this controller is actually a microcontroller like this. It could be a PLC in the case of an industrial setting. So this is microcontroller or a PLC that will get some information from outside. So it gets some information from outside. It might get some temperature, outside weather information. It might get some, uh, some other information from cloud. Okay, so the, the controller gets some information from the outside and then it maps the current state and the, whatever the reference state it is supposed to maintain, uses all that information to figure out what action it needs to take. Uh, that action gets transmitted to the actuator and the actuator is attached to a plant and the actuator runs the plant and then the actual state gets measured through sensors and then it gets fed back into the controller. So this is the stuff that you might have seen in your 3551 type class. I'm just going to change it a little bit. And what I'm going to do is, I will add the reference state as an input to the controller. So I'm not going to take the difference directly but there has to be some intelligent way of looking at the reference state, what the current state is, and figuring out what action I need to take. Okay. Now what are the different types of feedback control policy? So the first feedback control policy is P controller, which is a proportional, well, I should write proportional controller. Let me write PID controller, where UT is gamma T XT is KP XT plus KI summation of XT T equals one to, sorry, summation of XS, S equals one to T plus KD XT minus XT minus one. I guess in this case, I have to give um, the input has, okay, I, I guess I want to write ut as gamma t of x1 to xt, because it's taking the entire history into account, the history of states to derive this uh, control action. This is the famous PID controller. So here, this KP, KI, and KD, these are all matrices of appropriate dimension. So they'll have the number of, number of rows of these matrices is the same as number of actions. Number of columns of this matrices is the same as number of states in the system. Okay, so this is known as PID controller. And what typically happens is, uh, is you, when you go to a company, They'll give you the state description, they'll give you the action set or, or the action description, and they'll ask you to tune the PID controller, which means pick appropriate values of KP, KI, and KD so that the system functions normally. And there are many methods to tune PID controller. 
Uh, you can create a MATLAB Simulink model and you can do some initial testing of what KP, KI and KD matrices looks good. And once it looks good on MATLAB simulation, then you will go to an actual test bench, do a software in the loop simulation, hardware in the loop simulation, uh, do the actual field testing. Takes a lot of effort, okay? But finally, the output after one or two years of effort is you have a good KP matrix, a good KI matrix, and a good KD matrix that lets you control the system under all possible conditions that will be seen by that particular system. Okay, so when we talk about under all possible conditions, you are basically looking at normal operating conditions, okay? Not like when some hurricane is coming and impacting the system, but under normal, regular, day-to-day -day operating conditions. So these work very well in those situations. And that has been a traditional method of designing controllers for systems. Now, in the recent past, what has changed? So two things have changed. There are a lot more sensors now, and there is a lot more outside info that the controller can collect about the environment. What that means is, if I have more sensors, it means I can increase the dimension of the state space. If I have more information about the outside, I can actually tune my KP, KI, and KD, control, KD values on the fly using some sort of sophisticated optimization tools. Okay, and that has been the focus of multiple industries over the past few years, which is how do we use sensors, how do we use data to better control the system so as to meet all the requirements and also be sustainable, be green, be smart, be, I don't know, eco-friendly and all that stuff. So, so that's, the, that's the change. And in order to understand how to do that, we need to understand the model predictive control slash dynamic programming. Based control. So what that does is you have a system xt plus 1 equals to ft of xt ut wt. wt is the noise disturbance. Uh, for the time being let's assume that these are deterministic disturbance so we kind of know what the values are going to be uh, prior to starting the decision process. And I have a cost function uh, J, which is given by T equals 1 to capital T CT, XT, UT, WT. This is my cost function. What's inside J? These are all policies. So gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, all the way to gamma t. So these are just J is a performance index, which is a performance which maps policies to real numbers. Now, you don't just have these two, like the state dynamics and the cost function, you might also have. Um, some constraints these are known as constraints
the whole equation is called the cost function or like the, the summation the summation from t equals 1 to capital t is the cost function okay so the entire summation is the cost you have individual cost and then you add up the total thing and you get a total cost So this is something that you might have studied in 3551. This is something that you will be studying in 5551 if you're taking that class. So we will not be concentrating on this. That entire class is about how to figure out the KP, KI, and KD matrices. So we'll not think about it in, in terms of how to tune PID controller, but we will think about the dynamic programming based control in this class. And the time is up for today, but in the next class, I'm going to go over the theory of optimization, nonlinear optimization, to, uh, to solve this optimization problem, which is I want to minimize this cost function by picking an appropriate sequence of policies, gamma 1 to gamma t, such that the constraints are met and uh, the total cost is minimized. So we'll talk about that in the next class. That is going to be an overview of 5759, actually. So in the next two classes, we'll talk about optimization. Thank you.